Good afternoon and welcome. I want to first uh, thank all of you for coming to my session when I know it's the lunch hour, but perhaps starting with a photograph of donuts is a good way to recognize the importance of having a meal and also to maybe just cheer you up a little bit. I'm Laura Scandera Trombley and I'm the president of Southwestern University and I'm really glad to be here and in fact this is the first time that I've been at a conference in two years so I've missed you <laughs> and I'm really glad that we can spend a little bit of time together and so I'll dive right in and I just want to begin with a confession I really hate my title. Uh, well, maybe not hate, but at least a strong, st very strong dislike of this title. And don't get me wrong, I find the topic fascinating. How can we move institutions and ideas forward without losing sight of human beings who inhabit those institutions and who create those ideas for institutions. Empathy has to become part of the dialogue that we have about accountability and performance, especially as we try and create unity from all of the fractures that we have experienced over the last few years. But in regards to the title, Leading with Sugar and Empathy, look, I'm a Twain scholar. I study the rough and tumble world of satire. Plainly put, humor as Helga Kotta from the University of Freiburg stated in her research about humor, humor is an act of aggression. And so I'm no sentimentalist. When I was a kid, I was the one who didn't cry when Bambi's mother died. And I actually laughed when the monkeys beat up Dorothy. So <laughs> my parents' version of wellness for their kids was basically no fever spiking, no blood flowing, no bones showing, no problem. Now, this leads you to a particular world perspective when you grow up in this manner, and both of my parents were children during the Great Depression. And my father had it even worse because he was an orphan during the Great Depression and grew up in an orphanage. And so, not surprisingly, my parents' thres threshold for pain was quite high. And even in the most extreme circumstances, in their view, tears should be brief. I was raised to believe that expiration dates were arbitrary, that no canned good could ever be thrown away, that a full pantry was everything, and probably somewhere in my garage I still have some of my vintage 1968 mother's turtle soup hanging around, which is a frightening thought. So growing up hungry can understandably create appetites that will never be satisfied. For my parents, it generated something else, a true reserve of empathy, as fully stocked as their crazy pantry. They knew what want meant and what it felt like, and they possessed the capacity to understand the emotional needs of other people. And they tried to nurture in me a profound and deep understanding of our shared and simple humanity. We're all yearning, and after the past two years, we're all starving. My father spent 43 years teaching fourth grade, and every time he was asked if he'd be interested in being promoted, he refused, because he wanted to be with kids. He wanted to feed their minds and care for their emotional needs. He knew what it was like to be a child that was friendless, and in, to some degree, hopeless. And so his class of 1957, try and grasp this, the class of 1957, fourth graders, hold a reunion every year and they talk about my father. These are people in their 70s who, I attended a reunion a few years ago and they came up and they said, you know, that time when I was sick, your father went to our house to deliver my homework. My parents were divorced that year and so your father became my father figure. 60 years later, and they still talk about him. The courage and the resilience of my Depression-era parents taught me empathy as a kind of first responder. Exercise it enough, and empathy becomes part of your daily practice, just like sit-ups. Okay, I don't do sit-ups, but I do drink coffee as part of my everyday practice. Empathy becomes automatic, and that is true of practicing empathy as a means of communication, making it part of your organizational structure, and adopting it as a leadership style. 
We all feel the difference when we are treated with empathy and when we are not. And that leads us to donuts how? So let me explain a little bit more. In July of 2020, I was in the same position as college and university presidents were everywhere. And that was that gray area between beleaguered and besieged, panicked and petrified. We were all trying to figure out what are we going to do. It's no big surprise that for 2020, the OED couldn't settle on the word of the year. They didn't choose one. Should it be lock up, lock down, mask up, unmute, unprecedented pandemic? They just kind of threw up their hands. During my first meeting in July of 2020 with the Associated Colleges of the South presidents, all 16 of us, we were all on Zoom and I listened as everyone came up with their ideas about how they were going to deal with the opening of school in the fall. So put up plexiglass, put down dots, that'll keep us safe. Signage everywhere, arrows pointing in the correct direction. Four out of the 16 just said right out of the gate, we're not even gonna try, we're all online. And then there was the, we have to discipline students. We have to read them the riot act. We have to make it clear to these kids that if they don't follow our protocols, we're throwing them out, they're going home. Certainly we all felt the drastic times required drastic measures. But what I couldn't help but wonder as I was looking at all of the carefully controlled but probably truly deeply frightened faces of all of the presidents who were there, that drastic times also call for drastic creativity. And while we were scrambling to protect our students from this terrible virus, we didn't have the opportunity to think about how to protect them from our various preventions. I didn't hear in the responses the recognition that all of this technology, distancing, hand washing, and disciplining, what is that going to do? How could we maintain the ties that keep us together? We must resist increasing dangerous cultural and social messaging that it's okay to treat someone as an other or an object or an obstacle to be pushed aside. How can a college function if we fail to nourish these connections. A public announcement one local university made in the fall of 2020 that rhymes with Boston included a list of the various things that would prompt them to shut down. One of the items on the list, on the list was dead students. Don't get me wrong. I don't mean to, act, to set up some easy dichotomy between technology and community or science. I swear I'm not a Luddite. I can even work my television using the remote. I readily grant the necessity of social distancing and masking and washing our hands. And believe me, I understand that we have all been acting under unprecedented conditions. But something has been missing in all of these planning sessions. We were all too panicked to calculate what we were losing. We needed to find a space where we could simply be with each other outside of the panic and terror. We needed to be larger and more visible to each other than just a blurry postage stamp size face on a computer screen. The one thing that happened when we all finally started to reappear and be with each other in public, and I was president of a university for a year before most people actually saw me, was people kept telling me again and again and again how tall I am. <laughs> said, I've been that way for a long time. So what kept me up night after night? The problem that haunted me through all the pandemic semesters was all the punitive, proactive reactions to the virus, the shouted chorus of contradictory opinions that came flying over social media and email. Uh, you know, I heard everything from the campus wasn't safe enough, that the campus is too safe, that we should, this was my favorite, rip off the Band-Aid. I'm not sure what that meant, but it sounded painful to me. And then I had a handwritten eight-page letter from a parent telling me that I had personally destroyed the emotional well-being of the entire family because I canceled soccer. Welcome to Texas. I thought about how to nurture something positive on our campus. We committed to keeping the majority of our classes in class. Over 70% of our classes last year were actually taught in person and in class, but we canceled everything else. Everything that was fun, it was gone. Intramurals, no. Any kind of co-curricular activities, off-campus trips, 
trips, live music, theater, study abroad, anything you can imagine. We're not doing any of that. So by September, I kind of felt as though I was looking into a dark, no fun vortex. And I was about to have 1,500 students come onto campus. With all this pressure, what I really deeply needed was a donut, maybe five, maybe 10. That need, the need to feel pleasure, the need for a small indulgence, came second to a much greater need that I had, that I think we all shared, and that was the longing to be with my friends and family, and some relief from our constant worry. The pandemic and the separation it caused raised questions I thought I'd never have to answer in such awful circumstances. What does it mean to share a meal, to do it in person, to see someone smile, and to push worry aside for just a moment. Anthony Bourdain once described the beautiful intimacy of a shared meal, and I was struck by how we had completely eliminated that. That crossroads, a fitting metaphor for South by Southwest, was the beginning of the captain's sweet surprise. Because all social events were canceled, I had an untapped budget. There were go not going to be any parties at the president's house, and so, since I was new to Austin, I had always heard that Austin was the home of food trucks. So I decided, let's just have a dessert truck come on campus every week. And we then bought dozens of Adirondack chairs so people could be socially distanced. And I had no idea if anyone would show up, but people did. Students, faculty, and staff came, and the numbers grew every week. Staff volunteered to keep everyone at a safe distance while they ate their bunt cakes. And we created an origin myth around the sweet surprise. I'm an English professor, so everything has to have a narrative. And so the origin myth was there was a secret committee, no one knew who was on the committee, and they would bring in different surprises every week. No one knew what the surprises were, and they would never announce them until that very day. The numbers grew, the year passed. Over the summer, I had students writing me, asking me if the sweet surprise would continue. I was trying to figure out why they were so interested in making sure that dessert was going to be available on campus. And it was open to everyone, anyone who was on our campus. Right now, we have over 500 people coming every Wednesday. All of you are invited. Wednesdays, 1.30 to 3.30. Come. It's always great. I think maybe in the next few weeks we'll have snow cone day. Who can say? They're not telling me anything. But this is the one time when our community comes together. We actually come together. We come together to see each other, to smile at each other, to have a sense of just being with each other. And so how does this silly, joyful little in innovation create a kind of leadership? First, it demonstrates that community has a value. Being together has a value, an economic value, happy workplace, like joyful, joyful classrooms are productive. A physical value, well-being isn't a trend. Ignore the donuts, it's a way of life. Eating a healthy meal is an action that brings people together in a non-confrontational way. A moral value, we're called upon to feed the hungry world, to sustain each other in troubled times, and now that our campus is open to all of you, you would be treated as our valued guest. The way that my personal food pyramid works is it starts with fudge, then it transitions to sugary snacks, to a family-style table, and then finally to a gathering place where everyone is welcome, and that's the sweet surprise. So the past two years have been terrible, and while the research has established that a positive culture enhances performance and satisfaction, it's never been more difficult to try and create something like that. Recognizing that a caring emotional culture is key is one thing. Consciously doing the work to get there, to achieve a goal where every single member of your community feels valued, and we're a small liberal arts university, so you would think that we have the capacity to do that, becomes our most immediate challenge, with or without the pandemic. And so this has led us to Southwestern University S Unity Day. For the first time in our 182 year history, on February 23rd, after a year of planning by a team representing all of our constituency groups, the university held its very first S Unity Day. We gathered to celebrate and listen to each other. The all day cross campus event was designed to build 
a sense of belonging for everyone who is part of the institution. Everyone had the day off, all of our workers, all of our students, all of our faculty, everybody. It gave everyone the opportunity to converse with local professionals on relevant topics, to actually sit in a room together and not feel as though we had to rush to do the next thing. We could actually breathe and enjoy each other. There were team building exercises, sessions on mindfulness and meditation. We all watched a movie, we relaxed, we had lunch together, made art, and had a faculty staff volleyball team play against our students. You can just guess who won that match. But in the end, everyone was awfully happy. So it shouldn't take a pandemic to tell us that we need to spend more time together, to just be, to break bread, to listen and enjoy. Unity and community are the consequences of intentional design. Just as empathy is a learned practice, we're committed at Southwestern to designing our university as a place where empathy is an expected and required part of citizenship. I invite all of you to become architects of empathy and to design those moments, to make it part of your daily practice. And maybe just every now and then have a, have a donut along the way. I have here a list of some of the references that I thought you might find of interest that talk about leadership, community building, and the practice of empathy um, that were very helpful for me. And I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Mm -hmm.